Welcome to the Reputation Revolution. This is the show where we dissect what it takes to build a credible personal brand, one that's professional, uh, one that's recognized and has strength in the marketplace. My guest today helps visionaries, thought leaders and CEOs change the world. That's a big remit. Uh, she's all about replacing the noise in the online space with thoughtful, valuable and essential content. Hallelujah. Her name is Lacey Boggs. Lacey, welcome to the show. The question on everyone's lips, we're wanting to know what were you doing 10 years ago? It's funny. I actually can remember exactly what I was doing 10 years ago because I was like nine months pregnant, uh, about to give birth to my daughter. So uh, she'll be 10 in April. And um, I started this business because of her and after she was born. So <laughs> I was about ready to go on maternity leave from my last real job before <laughs> before starting a business. There you go. That's a perfect tent yeah. <laughs> right there. <laughs> so today you're running the Content Direction Agency. Tell us a little bit about that um, as a bit of context before we get into it because you're a copywriter extraordinaire. <laughs> yeah, so we provide um, strategy and content marketing content for small business owners who want to outsource that. So our our bread and butter is blogging retainers. We write blogs for other people's small businesses, but we also do other types of content as well. Terrific. So we're going to talk a bit about leadership marketing today because um, that's something that you focus on. And and I think the whole thing around, you know, it's whether some people call it thought leadership or but it's about putting the leaders out there, the visionaries, the uh, the CEOs, where they should be out front leading. Uh, but it's about creating content around them that's that's you know thoughtful and and uh, relevant, but maybe a bit provocative. Let's open up with uh, the thought leader uh, or the the leadership marketing. What's your sort of definition? What 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 are you, the sorts of things you're doing with your clients? Sure. Um the way it came about that I started using that term is that I realized I was seeing all these people in in their spaces that were leaders in their industries, um, but they were following the cookie cutter marketing plans, right? They were doing the same old, same old to market their business um, and weren't really giving any thought to how they could lead with their marketing, right? So if you're a leader in your industry, it seems to me that it should follow that you're a leader with your marketing as well. And so I really like to help our clients sort of think outside the box a little bit like do we actually have to follow this yep. three-step plan that everybody else is following or can we <laughs> um, mix and match take take pieces from other ideas um, figure out what actually makes you you and makes you stand out and then you can stand out with your marketing as well and and I always say it's a, it's sort of an intersection of the brand and the brand voice uh, the ideal customer and then what the data is showing us for what's working and where those three things meet is where you can really create a leadership marketing plan that's unique to your business because your business is unique. So when you say what the data's showing, so I guess the brand voice, they, they, are they mostly running their own company, mm -hmm. clearly? Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got to obviously overlay the personal brand themselves, right. make, and usually there's a you'd hope that they're aligned <laughs> um, in terms of the brand voice. But then where does the data fit into that? So sometimes um, what will happen is the, the CEO or whomever it is will say, you know, oh, I love to do podcasts, but the podcast is not converting for me. And it's like, well, okay, so let's let's examine then. Maybe it's more about um, your you're doing a podcast or you're dictating and then we turn it into an article because that converts better or it could be vice versa you know oh i've tried blogs all this yeah. time but they're not really driving traffic oh well let's try something else let's put some videos with them let's try some podcasts whatever it might be um finding that i'm, I'm not even talking about like really deep marketing analytics or anything like that but just what is working yeah. in terms of driving traffic or or meeting those metrics to move your business forward yeah and you, you recently wrote a piece about outsourcing thought leadership. Um, and no doubt you come across people that want to outsource everything, but you've got to do thinking. I, you, that was a contention of your article. Um, there's certain things you can outsource. So I want to unpack that a little bit because I think there's some really interesting, um, you know, because people are time poor and CEOs or leaders and of businesses are, but... You know, you go into the, the but they say, oh, I want to be a thought leader, but you've actually, your brain's got to hurt a little bit. 
do you come across people that just want to outsource everything completely? And and ha- what what's it? Let's unpack a little bit the, um, you know, the balance between what. The, the leader, the, the, the person has to do and, and what someone like you can help them with? Sure. I would say that for most of our clients, they're still very much participating in the process, meaning that uh, a lot of times the writer, writer will come in and interview them and get their thoughts on, on whatever the topic is and then turn it into something polished and ready to go on the website. Yep. Um, but, you know, occasionally you come across somebody who's like, I just need you to come up with the ideas and there is a limit to what a writer can do that's not in your brain that's not uh in your business that's not the ceo of the company i think that i i can't really even think of an example where somebody's come in and be like be my thought leader (laughs) but um yeah the the reason i wrote that article was more to remind people that that is your job as the visionary as the ceo is to have those big thoughts and and therefore a lot of times it's it falls off our to-do list because especially if you're not a big business if you're still doing some of the client work or if you're still you know maybe you're in sales or marketing you're just still doing some part of the main operations of the business it's very easy for that visionary work to fall off the to-do list right and so really what i wanted to just remind people is like hey that's part of your job description as the ceo is to have (laughs) those big ideas and you can outsource a lot of the process but you still have to make the time and the space to have those big ideas and and some don't have them yeah (laughs) i mean so uh, you know we've all come across people who want to be you know i want to be a thought leader um a lot of people proclaim they're thought leaders but um (laughs) and clearly they're not but (laughs) but you know there are people that want to you know i want to be up there in lights i want to build my reputation and be you know seen as a thought leader um but they don't want to put the work in and and they haven't got the ideas in the first place how do you um, do you knock people back because they haven't got that? That's that's their whole game. Game is to be famous and well known, but they really haven't got much uh, meat behind them. Well, you know, there's only so much we can do at that point, right? Um, when yep. I do a strategy session with people, I'm I'm pretty good at it's one of my talents to pull the gold out. You know, to to mine for the gold and get the ideas. They may have ideas, they just haven't uh, thought about them or. or yep put them in writing yet um i think that there is only so much you can do if you know my my team can do if they're regurgitating old stuff like sure we can get you out there or you could pay for pr you could pay to be on forbes or whatever it is um but if Mm. the ideas aren't unique if they're not new nobody's really going to listen to it you at least have to have a new spin on an old idea um of course even, of you course. know I, I think there's some people who think there's nothing new under the sun which i agree with to some extent but um we can <laughs> certainly remix it and put our own spin on it and, and yeah. give it our own flavor and then it becomes new and interesting and people because a lot of times even if it's the same topic uh, people need to hear it in a different way. They're going to resonate with me saying one yeah. thing and you saying something else, right? Because even if we're talking about the same thing, just they're going to resonate with the different ways we say it. And that's valid. Uh, but you still do have to kind of have that idea to put your own spin on it or your own metaphor, whatever it is. Yeah. And and a flag in the ground, mm-hmm. um, standing for something, mm-hmm. I guess, is the, is the key that's, that's relevant to that big idea. And it might be something that's wrong with your industry or you're railing against something. <laughs> Um, right. that, that's often a really good, a really good starting point. Or you've got IP or a framework to, um, to um, you know, to talk talk about an issue or something, and you've put some some heavy duty thinking of it. And some people just do research, and they they you know they can if they've got the numbers and they've done the research. We see a number of um, businesses and businesses led by entrepreneurs who who do research. We recently had on Andy Crestadina. Who, um, recently who does a lot of research um, around uh, bloggers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that's pushing the conversation further, isn't it? You're influencing the conversation out there. Exactly. Um, in terms of framework, you, you've, you've got a framework you walk people through in a, in, a, in a, you know, I'm just saying in a general sense, I'd like to unpack that if I may. Sure. What, are, what are the building blocks of, of the framework to build some thought leader marketing? Yeah, so we're actually I'm developing a new program right now. So I've been this has been on my mind <laughs> deeply right now. Um, 
I think it starts with uh, what I'm calling conscious consumption. So it's about a lot of times we're just feeding our brains junk food, uh, <laughs> scrolling Instagram, binge watching Netflix, you know, and I like binge watching Netflix as much as the next person, but it's not necessarily going to trigger my next great business idea. I think making time for conscious consumption, whether that's reading a book, listening to podcasts like this one, um, you know, reading articles that are in your niche is, is a good first step. Um, and then you kind of have to have a system for, you mentioned research. How are you going to keep all these ideas? Where are you going to put them? If, if they're just living in your head all the time or if they're just living on post-it notes stuck around your life, you're, you're not going to be as easily able to make the connections that really create yep. thought leadership, right? And then mm, um, mm, mm. once you can make those connections, once you have it sort of organized in a system, then you can start remixing and resharing and and coming up with those that's where the real creation process starts is when you can yeah. start drawing connections between things that otherwise people aren't making connections with i have a great example of this um are you familiar with the author mike mccallowitz he wrote profit first yes some other ones yeah yes yes so in his book um clockwork he talks about the queen bee role in the business. And so what he did was he realized when he was studying productivity and things, he realized that the queen bee is the most important role in the beehive. And it's not even the bee herself, right? Because if the bee herself doesn't fulfill the role anymore, they get rid of her and get a new queen. But, but the queen bee role is the most important <laughs> in the beehive. And so he, that whole book is about finding really about finding your, your queen bee role in your business. And so he has drawn a connection with something. We all understand beehives mm. at some level, right? And um, yeah, he's drawn yeah. a connection that's unique and, and interesting. And that's what makes him a thought leader is he's able to do that kind of thing. He does. He loves his analogies. He's the one with something about pumpkins as yes, well, isn't yes, he? Yes, pumpkin plant. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's a good, it's, it's a good lesson right there, a tool there to, to be able to take a complex topic potentially and to use an analogy to break it down. And, 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 and Mike does that and he writes books about it and they're incredibly successful books yep. and allows you to then communicate you know, your story and uh, your, your idea. Um, so analogies work pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the, you know, do they, if people, are they, they're formed, are their ideas kind of formed by the time they get to you or the big role now is to really get it, get it out of them? Is it, you know, it's always there in the surface. Do you reckon people are, you know, have got an idea most of the time, so they just don't know how to expand on it or they just need a bit more coaxing along to get that gold out of them? It really depends on the client. Uh, some people come to us and they really do have a, a flag, as you said, planted for what their thought leadership is and where they stand in their business. And then it's just a matter of yeah. us getting it from them and translating it into a beautifully written post. And then there are other people who definitely come. I, I, what I hear a lot is people who've been in business for, you know, five, eight, ten years. And they're like, I've said everything there is to say. There's nothing left <laughs> to blog about. And that's when we kind of have to, okay, let's tease this out. Is Have we really said it all? Can we come at it from a different angle? Can we approach a different subset of your audience that might need to hear it in a different way? Things like that. And then, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm developing this new program that really is going to hopefully help people start from scratch. The idea is you come in mm. and we will really go through that model and say, like, all right, you got to do the you got to identify what you're going to consume, what content you're going to consume and how are you going to research it and really start from scratch a little further back, you know, um, mm. for people yeah, who aren't, <laughs> who don't have that yet. Yeah. And so I guess the other thing is the ideas have got to be big enough to be able to go across, you know, you've got to stick with it for quite some period of time. What's your thinking about the longevity of um, time? Because, I mean, obviously ideas evolve and new information comes in and research. So you can take something for quite a long way. Um, what, what, what's your thinking on that? Uh, that's a great question. I feel like that topics have their own lifespan and it, it also has to do with what you want out of it for your business meaning um are you just exploring a topic because it's interesting is it leading up to some yep. some new thing you're selling or you know what what is the goal overall i i have started um suggesting to people that when they want to make a pivot or start testing out a new topic that maybe they pick one of their marketing channels and use that as kind of a 
uh, show your work channel, learning out loud channel, where you're testing new ideas and seeing how people respond. And then you can kind of go, yeah. oh, that one, that one touched a nerve. That might be where I need to uh, expand some more. And then that helps you also see like, I don't know about you, but I have to process, like the way I create content is how I process my ideas. You know, when I'm writing an article, that's how I'm processing it yeah. for myself. So um, a lot of times you have to go through that that process and, and work it out on your own as you're creating it for the people. So um, I don't know that there's like a set. I can't say, oh, well, one topic is three years, you know, but <laughs> they're all going to be a little bit different. But um Indeed. Yeah, we also have to stay... Depends how, how meaty they are. Yeah, mm. and you have to stay interested. You have to stay fresh. If you're the content creator and you get bored, guess what? People will be able to tell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's an interesting one. Because, and then also a good thought leader brings people into the conversation mm -hmm. and it's not just about them. So you might kickstart the conversation and you might drop these gems out there you know whether it's videos or through podcasting or or written blog posts um or even linkedin you know updates but you part of the role is to get other people involved and to talk to other people and and draw them into the conversation because i mean that's what isn't it that's what you know adds up to the idea mm -hmm. um i've always thought that you know the, the more traditional thought leaders who just did the book speaking book speaking type thing you look at their social media and it's all about them mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and what they're doing today and this where i'm speaking and doing this whereas the sort of the the more modern progressive thought leader is out there you know drumming up interest conversation sparking debate and, and that's what we, we kind of gravitate to. I mm -hmm. think it's about as much about the community uh, as it is about the ideas. Mm -hmm. With the, um, you, you talk about uh, the big rocks in your business and, and what they are, and they're the things that you have to, uh, you know, tick off. And, uh, but you're saying uh, in, one, in one, one article you wrote uh, about one of the big rocks is your message. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunately, CEOs don't look at it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing too busy running about their business. Um, I mean, I guess this, this, you're saying that the message is also part of your sort of thought leadership positioning. Can you walk us through your thinking around that? Because I love, I love the analogy on that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, every business is here to solve a problem. And you started it because you were passionate about solving that problem. Um, and so I think the messaging stems from that, especially in the beginning. You, you, you tap into your, your passion for solving whatever the problem is. But as a business matures and as we get busier and, and all those things, sometimes that can fall by the wayside. And we get so um, wrapped up in, like you were saying, what's, what's the newest tactic? What's club? Oh, I got to be on Clubhouse. I got to be on TikTok. I got to be... <laughs> What's a reel? How do I do an Instagram reel? You know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> sometimes those sorts of things can e eclipse the message where really I, I firmly believe that the channel and the tactics are much less important than the message. So if you have a topic, a message of value that you want to share, um, it, if you share it well, it really doesn't matter which channel people will find you. And you'll build a following. Yeah. Um, so that having those ideas and nailing that messaging and deciding what you're going to stand for is, to me, very, very important. And it's not something to be left to. I, I, at least most of my clients don't have like a marketing department. They're not to that point yet. But it's not to be left to, say, a social media manager or, you know, the copywriter that's writing your emails or even someone like us. Um, you don't want to delegate your values. You don't want to delegate what your business stands for. And that's still got to be on the CEO's plate. So part of the, I guess, the thought leadership positioning is if there's a big issue facing the industry and you want to be known for you know, speaking out about it and put that flag in the ground and then you create the content around that. And I guess you're talking about your message is more probably about your business and the problem you're solving and the audience you serve. You, you, the delicacy there is to bring the two together mm -hmm. and and you know there's clearly always going to be a dotted line i mean it doesn't have to be in your face in fact if you're doing leadership content and you know you're pitching your wares at the same time and then it's not going to kind of work is it mm -hmm. how do you get that balance between getting the commercial message through um but when we're talking about um leadership i call it leadership content mm -hmm. um how that you know that's that's 
that's not a commercial message. Do you do you find pushback? Do people push back on that? Yeah, and again, it, it, it can depend on the, the company's goals at the moment, right? So if we're launching a new product, it's probably not the time for, for a big think piece on <laughs> on the, the state of the industry necessarily, right? We want to be focused on selling. However, most companies have cycles they go through where, you know, sometimes they have some downtime, they have in-between time. Mm -hmm. So that may be when it's time for thought leadership. Um, Alternately, it may be, again, that you choose one channel. So we definitely have clients where maybe the emails that people sign up for are more of that thought leadership. And then the the outward-facing, the social media, the blog posts might be more salesy, right? Uh, But if you're going to come into my inner circle, that's where you get my... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> deep thinky thoughts. Um, so there's a couple of different yeah. ways to do it. I think also, though, you know, building your brand, building your reputation as a leader in your industry will by default sell whatever you're selling because people do business with people they know, like, and trust. Um, and so if you get known for something, you're going to automatically build the reputation of your brand that goes with it. I think of people like... Um, James Clear. He blogged for years about habits and life hacks and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then Atomic Habits like shot to the top of the uh, bestseller list as soon as it came out, right? Because he was already well known for those. And I think he's probably one of those like more traditional thought leaders like you were talking about. But um, the same can be said of of business owners too, I think. Yeah. And and he's, I mean, email and and blogging and the old school stuff old really, school stuff. really works for him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's just go dive into a bit of old school stuff yeah. because I mean, clearly you're a writer and you believe in blogging. And I guess we've had video and audios going nuts and clubhouse, as you mentioned, and all of those things. But there is room for the humble blog. In fact, this is top of mind because I only wrote a blog post about it, uh, published it last mm-hmm. night. And I wake up this morning and on Twitter, everyone's having this conversation about why don't we get on podcast on a podcast and discuss the merits of blogging. Um, what, <laughs> <laughs> what's what's your take on where the where the humble blog sits because it's been around a bit now yeah, yeah the, I feel like that the uh, we were saying this in the green room before we started but if, if I had a, a nickel for every time I heard somebody say blogging is dead I'd be rich because they keep they keep declaring <laughs> it dead and then it's really not um, I think there will always be a place for long form text content uh, the way the internet is right now. Yes, video, yes, uh, yes, pictures, yes, all those things, but it's still very text-based, right? Um, yeah. At least right now as we're recording this, Google is starting to crawl uh, audio content and videos for keywords, but we've all seen how AI transcribes things, and that's how that works, and it's not <laughs> very accurate. And no. um, it's also really hard, you and I just talking right now, to optimize this content for a particular keyword, right? So um, there, there's a lot of opportunities that are still completely text-based. Also, let's think about accessibility. There's always going to be people who can't or choose not to listen to an audio or watch a video. And text is uh, has much more accessibility because of screen readers and other things. So there's a lot of different reasons, I think. Also, you just can't necessarily convey thought leadership in a single tweet i think it's interesting that like twitter's still big and and everybody likes it but like there are these tweet um threads that are 20 30 tweets long and i'm like like, guys that's a blog that's a blog it's just broken (laughs) yes yeah (laughs) and we look at you know we look at the growth of medium medium medium.com um as a as a long longer form um blogging platform and i think the average oh, i'm probably making this up now but i know the average uh reading length is you know seven to nine minutes or something like that so they're, yeah. they're, they're chunky pieces and you've got to have places to put those chunky pieces and not every blog post has to be long of course but um but if you if you've got depth that you need to get out there then it does take you know a little bit of uh a little bit of work on on the writing side but of course you know, again, like we we have with audio, we can do so many different things with audio apart from podcasting. Mm-hmm. With writing, you know, you can have ebooks and and all sorts of things. You know, white papers and there are you know, it's not just necessarily a blog post. Absolutely, so and I in, I also in that regard. sorry, I uh, <laughs> I also believe very very much that like um, there's no one correct 
channel for any, you know, you, it's not, I'm not, just because I write blogs and that's my business, I'm not going to sit here and say every single person listening to this needs to go have a blog right now because that's just not the truth. Uh, it's not going to be the best channel for every business. But um, I do also think, you know, if you if you like podcasting or making videos, awesome, do that. And then have somebody yep. translate it into an article. Have somebody take the transcript and write an article based on that. And then you're hitting two segments of the population, two different channels. That's right. Um, there's lots of different ways to make it make it work. I, I think that the whole content repurposing thing is just such a thing now. Yeah. And, um, you know, whether it's video or audio. But even if, you know, even if you, even if you um, do have an article now, you know, you can... I've got, I don't even know what it's called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's on the top of my blogs and you can click that and you can listen to listen it. Listen to it, Red, right. sure. Um, and, and I know at, at one point, um, Jay Bear's company, Convince and Convert, they did a podcast of their articles. So you could listen to each article as an episode. Yeah. So I think that there's, you know, again, there's values, there's value across the board uh, because we, we let people listen in, and learn in different ways. Uh, I'd love to get a sort of a case study from you or a, just an example or examples of, of people that you've worked with who had something, you know, of, of value. They had ideas, um, but they just didn't know how to get them out and you helped them get it out and, and how they how they then got those ideas out into the world and, and uh, you know, the sort of results they got. Sure. Um, one of my favorites is a client from a few years ago. Um, we worked with a company called Bluffworks. It's a, it's a men's clothing. Actually, I think they've added women's now, but they, they make technical clothing that doesn't look technical. So it's the kind of stuff you wear on an airplane and it doesn't wrinkle, but they make it so it doesn't look like your average travel gear, right? It looks like a suit or whatever. Um, and when I met the, the owner, they had just come off, they had done a rebrand and they called it the sad model rebrand because they had gone with this like Madison Avenue branding company that had put all these pensive models on their website and it just completely tanked everything because the way the business had gotten started was on Kickstarter and everybody loved the founder, the owner, because he had such a great personality. And so I was brought in to help bring a little bit of that personality back to the brand. And so he and I worked together for probably four years. Um, we told a lot of his crazy travel stories, like hitchhiking on a boat across the around the world and like, you know, getting mugged in Vietnam. I don't even remember them all, but he had all these crazy travel stories <laughs> that went great with, you know, the content of his business because it's all about traveling and, and, and things like that. And yeah. um, what the, the real pinnacle of that working relationship for us was he decided to um, get some angel investing. And so we wrote a blog post all about why he'd started with Kickstarter and why we were doing angel investing and all this. And then um, wrote an email to his list. And his list at the time was about 10,000 guys who wear pants. I mean, that's really what it was, right? It wasn't anything <laughs> special. And at the bottom of the email, we put a PS that said, PS, if you're an accredited angel investor and you'd like to talk to us, hit reply and Stefan will get back to you. Well, uh, within a week, he had six replies, and it turned into over $300,000 in angel investing for his business. So I like to call that my $300,000 email. <laughs> but <laughs> in reality, I think it was the work we had done for four years that had built him back up with his community so that they trusted him. Mm. They knew who he mm. was. So that immediately when those people got that email, they could say, yes, I want to be a part of this. And I think that was really I so cool like that. Yeah. Yeah. I so like that you've told that story. Um, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> the, you know, that it's taken four years to get to that point and you've got to earn the right. I, you know, mm -hmm. I talk about before, what you, what you do before the pitch, what happens before the funnel, mm -hmm. um, you know, what happens and that's before the pitch for four years, you've been, you know, earning the right to, you know, come out with something. And if people, you know, you're top of mind, they know you, they like you, they trust you, they respect you, then they're more predisposed for your for your, um, for your your sales message anyway. And I think this whole thing about going out cold all the time and spending money, sure, anyone can do that, but it's going to cost you in the long run because no one even knows who you are and there's no reason for them to stop their thumbs on, on, on if they're looking on their mobile phone. Whereas, right. you know, if they've read you, followed you at times or whatever and your message comes out, they're actually probably interested. 
Um, so at sent, least predisposed to your message. Right. Yep. If we had sent four years of emails that were just like, hey, buy some pants, hey, buy some pants, hey, buy some pants, I don't think that would have been uh, as good of a pitch as no. the fact that we were you know, letting them into Stefan's world and letting them know who he was. And interesting with the email, you're doing much um, emails with your clients as well because we know email has never gone away, but in the blogging field, it's a bit like that. It's old school. It's unsexy. Oh, I can do this great audio stuff over there. Yeah, I can go to this clubhouse again. Um, but, you know, as we know, um, there's a lot happening on the, which would gladden your heart, the, the <laughs> sub stacks of this world. And, and Twitter's just bought Review, which is a, a, uh, newsletter, a, a newsletter platform, and as is sub, a sub stack. Uh, email newsletter. Um, what's your thinking around the space at the moment? What are you seeing? I think it's it's honestly it's another blog platform, right? It's a way to get that mm. long form content into people's inboxes, into their into their hands, into their brains. Um, you know, people. I don't know anybody who's like, oh yes, I have five blogs I go read every day. Like, no, nobody does that anymore. We get it through social media or we get it through email. Um, email is still incredibly effective, both for uh, reaching people with your content, but also for making sales. And so um, mm. I think it's really important to remember that and remember that um, it's still a really important channel for reaching people because they're, if they're, it's, it's Seth Godin's permission marketing, right? If they've said yes, yeah. I'll let you into my world, um, you've already mm. gotten over that first barrier to them doing business with you. Yeah. And, and particularly if they're subscribing to you for your thoughts versus, um, you know, you've given them an incentive and they've gone for the incentive, which works, you know, it's like the lead magnet. Right. But, you know, if you've got that reputation and people like what you're writing about, they're more likely to stick around. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which is, which is which is absolute key. Terrific. Well, there's a lot to unpack. Well, we've unpacked a fair bit. But there's <laughs> a lot in this space. Um, I think. Um, what, what's your like? You know, your top couple of if you if you had to give I'm gonna, if someone put a gun to your head. What are your top tips for just getting that information out of your head? And if you want to go down this path as a thought leader. Um, you want to build a thought leadership positioning in the marketplace. Um, what, what, what are some of the th things, the ideas where people can start from pretty much ground zero um, before they even get to someone like you? Yeah. I think the first thing is to understand how like how you like to process. So are you a, are you a verbal processor? Do you like to write it out? And then create a system for just working through some ideas. So whether that's um, you write drafts somewhere that you or that you can look at later, or you um, make phone recordings, you know that you can listen to later. Um, a really great thing we do is interviewing our clients. So if you can find somebody, uh, even on your team or a friend, who yeah. can interview about you, interview you about a topic, that's a great way to pull out the gold. Um, the more yeah, often I do podcast yeah. interviews, I always find some nugget that I say that comes to me in an interview. Um, so that's really good. And then. It's about keeping track of those ideas once you have them and really um, narrowing them down and winnowing out the good things. Uh, and then you just got to test it, right? So put it on, as you mentioned, yeah. put it on LinkedIn, put it on Facebook, put it on wherever you are, see how it goes over. And the ones that get the most response, you're like, aha, that might be an avenue to yeah. keep going down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, and I do like that testing out in, in LinkedIn um, it's probably a really good place to do it. Mm -hmm. You've got 1,300 characters to, to get stuff happening, um, but, you know, to get a little bit of meat there, but it's just a morsel for you know, getting conversation. But ask people the question. Ask people questions, right. you know. Um, you can even do polls and stuff like that um, through social now, mm -hmm. uh, which it can be quite effective in getting feedback from people and getting them in, involved. I guess the other, the other part you write is just, you know, if talking... You know, if you're in the car or just, you know, getting onto the phone, uh, a client of mine uses otter, otter.ai, mm -hmm. and uh, he just riffs, and then out it comes back back again, which is a, a terrific thing, and I can look through his thoughts uh, that way. Yeah. Uh, but you're getting them raw, aren't you? You're getting them raw in their thinking, and they're just, you know, because, but if they s stop to write them down, ain't going to happen. A lot of people have a, a block happen. somewhere between their brain and, and the typing or the writing, and, and that's okay. The, um, that's what people like me exist for, <laughs> is to help uh, eliminate that block. <laughs> yeah, terrific. Um, 
Thanks very much for your time, Lacey. Um, really enjoyed the chat. And where can people find you online? Sure. I am at LaceyBoggs.com, and that's usually the best place to find me. My blog goes back, as I said, about nine years, so there's lots of content there to go. There's lots, go lots of content. Through. Yeah. And uh, the Content Direction Agency is your business, but I, um, I do encourage people to go to your website because... It is. Uh, it's themed, very noir, and uh, you, and and we were talking off air about uh, it's really hard to get a theme running right throughout a a website uh, visually and in terms of copy. But I actually I think you've nailed it pretty well. Uh, even got the typewriter font, uh, so very noir takes you takes you back into the. I don't know the forties, is it the fifties? I don't know, <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's got that 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 wonderful uh, visual flavour to it. Uh, I, I, I recommend people uh, check it out. Thanks very much, and um, thank you. I'm glad to have you on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>